Well, thanks very much to, to, to you, Francis, and to Global Net for uh, sponsoring another of these uh, um, sort of multifaceted meetings. Um, I mean, I suppose on the subject of foreign aid, I should be, I should be popping champagne corks, really, because this is the year in which something that I've been campaigning for for about 40 years, <laughs> I think, probably since about as early as I was politically conscious, um, which is the achievement of um, the devotion of 0.7% of our national wealth to overseas development assistance, to auto aid. Um, and that is something that we've been campaigning for for just decades, um, and it is, uh, it is going to be achieved. I think I've tried to, to get a combination of Treasury and DFID to tell me the actual mathematical moment when we're going to hit 0.7%. The closest we've got is somewhere around March 2014, I think, so it's towards the back end of this financial year. Um, but it, it is going to be a momentous moment. But it is slightly ironic that having spent so long trying to get there, by the time we've got there, most of those, who've, most of, those of us who've been campaigning for it, it has kind of dawned on us gradually that actually the sheer quantum of aid was far from being the most important thing to campaign for. And that a number of other things have, over the years, uh, really assumed much, much greater importance. Uh, one is the environment and the impact that things like climate change can have on people's lives, how they will affect the poorest, hardest and earliest. Um, there are the issues that uh, were a great focus during the 90s and the early years of this century around, aid and, uh, around trade and debt as well as aid. Um, then there is the, the massive importance of business and economic development. And I always tend to tell one story around this, which is when I worked for Oxfam uh, and I was uh, doing some work in India, and I wasn't, on the, I wasn't a development expert, I hasten to add, I was doing basically fundraising from within the Indian uh, population there. But I went to see projects and talk to corporates in particular about whether they could, uh, we could support uh, you know, positive things that they were doing, they could support us with uh, financial contributions and things like that. And there was one company that we'd had quite advanced discussions with. And being Oxfam, we were very thorough about vetting them for their positive impact on poor communities. And we discovered in the process of this vetting that they had been in investing in intensive aquaculture, basically shrimp farming, that was wrecking the local environment of coastal um, communities basically halfway around India. And in the discussion it emerged that actually they were disinvesting from this whole business because they, they thought that it had a, a negative effect on communities, that, that even if it delivered short-term wealth it had a a long-term negative impact on the environment and actually then the long-term sustainability of, of agriculture in those areas. And um, it occurred to me that actually that single decision by one company to disinvest from one business was probably going to have more impact on more people's lives than Oxfam's entire programme in India that year. And the scale of the impact that business or... Um, economic development can have is out of all proportion to what NGOs can do and it is probably out of all proportion in, a, in some senses to what government aid programmes and uh, state aid programmes can do as well. And actually we've seen the other side of that coin in countries like uh, China in the intervening decades where economic development has for good or ill lifted millions of people out of poverty, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty although at some, sometimes at some social and environmental cost as well. Uh, and then finally, I think there's the issue of war and conflict. And it's just become, I mean, it was always pretty clear, but I suppose it's been analysed more now, um, the extent to which war and conflict are development in reverse. And actually, the measurement of the Millennium Development Goals and the, the fact that so few conflict-afflicted uh, states have achieved any of those Millennium Development Goals now, many of them have actually gone into reverse on some indicators. It's just become clearer and clearer. Um, and so I think the, the discussion around aid has got to... Well, it has changed and it's going to have to change some more. And I think even from the sort of Glen Eagles era when we talked about aid, trade and debt, uh, things have still changed since then. I mean, you've got the economic power shifting. The idea that you had developed countries that pretty consistently you know, had healthy economies and grew and were relatively affluent and had money to spare, and you had poorer countries who uh, didn't, you know, found it struggled to grow and struggled to achieve prosperity, now looks a bit um, balmy and myopic, actually. 
when you have growth rates. Um, I mean, you have China and India continuing to record growth rates <coughs> close to double figures. Um, many African economies now averaging, I think, 6.2% in recent years, uh, which is close to the number required to double the size of their economies within a decade. While, of course, uh, the, the rich and developed world is um, previously developed world, we might call it, uh, now struggling to, to achieve any growth at all. But I think that just because aid isn't the most important thing to think about doesn't mean to say it's not important and doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to do it well. And there was an analysis of the value of the 0.7%, the value of aid, by um, a, an organisation called the One Campaign, which is a kind of umbrella group for, for NGOs. And before you think this is issued by some sort of coalition press office, uh, this, these stats came from uh, Development Initiatives, which is a very well-respected independent group of academics and analysts. And they calculated that between 2012 and 2015, um, that the UK aid plans, as they stood, would put 15.9 million people, children into school, many of them girls, with quite a conscious emphasis on getting girls into school, provide over 80 million children with vaccines against life-threatening diseases, probably saving 1.4 million lives, help 44.9 million people participate in freer and fairer elections, support over 40 million people with prevention or treatment for malaria, including distributing 26 million bed nets, provide access to safe drinking water to over 17 million people, help 77.6 million people access formal financial services such as bank accounts or credit, which are the basics needed to, to start businesses, ensure 5.8 million births take place in a safe environment, saving the lives of over 50,000 mothers, provide 633,000 people with life-saving treatment for HIV, and ensure better nutrition for 9.6 million people. In terms of the sheer impact on the number of people, that makes DFID by a country mile the most impactful and effective department in the British government. Probably more impactful than all the other departments put together who overwhelmingly only affect people in, in this one country. So um, it's an extraordinary list, but I think there are now deeper questions that we have to start asking, even if um, we value that kind of impact. Uh, one is, um, what does really what does good aid look like now? Um, and having having conservatives, and I, I'm a liberal democrat, so I, I'm positive, but sometimes slightly tried by the concept of coalition. Um, but it has been, in a funny sort of way, quite good. I think having conservative ministers running DFID, they are very focused on value for money. It is one of their mantras, and the reviews, the multilateral and bilateral aid reviews, and things like this have, I think, lent a real focus on impact and actual results, which has been very healthy, actually. Um, and I think that's good. But I think there are other questions you need to ask. You need to ask about the balance between humanitarian relief and economic development and rights, actually. Um, and we can perhaps talk a little bit more about that. Um, the Centre for Global Development, um, which is based in, in Washington, D.C., ranks... 22 OECD countries on how they're helping poor countries and we come 12th out of 22 and we do well on some things we do well on investment and environment we do quite well on um, uh, peacekeeping and humanitarian interve interventions and things like this uh, we do well on helping refugees during humanitarian crises but we don't do so, so well on things like migration, rather controversial one. We don't do so well, too well on trade and agricultural subsidies because as part of the EU uh, we have a hugely distorting effect on, on developing country economies through, the, um, through agricultural subsidies. And we do have done very badly over um, our high arms exports to undemocratic countries which actually helps to fuel conflict. So, you know, in a sense, we're doing very, you know, patting ourselves on the back for reaching 0.7% with one, in one hand and then almost undermining it uh, by um, fueling arms sales on the other side. But we've also been supporting the Arms Trade Treaty and so hopefully that situation can now improve. And actually, in the light of the Arab Spring, the coalition government, I think, withdrew about 140-plus arms licences to various um, undesirable regimes. There are other questions. I'm probably out of time by now, so um, I'll just whiz through them. But <clears throat> does the aid really focus on the poorest? And are the poorest people always in the poorest countries? We've had the announcement of the end of aid to China and to India 
and today to South Africa as well in time. Um, and so, and a much greater focus as a result of those reviews on fragile and conflict affected states. But we know that three quarters of the poorest people in the world live actually in middle income countries. So it's not always a straight line relationship between the poorest countries and the, and the poorest people. We have to ask, third question, is it accountable, transparent, is it effective, is it um, environmentally sustainable, is it just, does it empower or disempower women, does it empower or disempower minority communities, um, and a particular bugbear of mine, does it disempower tribal peoples who are sometimes some of the most marginal and um, discriminated against people in, in countries all over the world. Um, do you need to have good governance? Do you need a good rule of law? Do you need democracy? Should aid be conditional on any of those things? And I think we have got ourselves in a slightly confused position over all those things just in, in the last year or so. Uh, and what is the relationship between that aid and um, foreign policy and defence policy, war policy even, if you, if you like to think of it like that? Um, are there, in focusing on conflict-affected affected states, is there a real peace dividend that, that people can see? And are we, are we, is it right to try and link those two and try and exaggerate that? And the final question is, what, outside of the official aid budget, what's the rest of government doing? Uh, is, you know, what is BIS doing on arms trade? What's it doing on trade policy, on technology transfer, on encouraging not just investment in a sort of... Uh, uh, the sort of traditional business model, but things like making remittances easier, because that's an amazing flow of funds to developing countries. Uh, and what is DEC doing in its uh, discussions on the international climate change talks? How are those interacting with development? And what's the rest of the EU doing, and can we coordinate better with them? Is there a new European model of, of planning development, uh, which actually joins up what different countries are doing better and actually makes that more effective and more cost effective as well. So yes, let's celebrate re reaching 0.7% and yes, let's keep on uh, confronting those kind of blockhead little Englanders who think that this stuff doesn't matter and is not of mutual interest and doesn't help some of the poorest people in the world because I think it does. But I think there are many, many questions that we need to now ask more than ever about how and uh, how fairly we spend that, that money.